Hello, my name's Dave Emery, and in the next half hour, we're going to take a look at what, for lack of a better term, might be called intergenerational political repression. That might sound strange. I'm going to shorten the title of this to Fortunate Son 2. In the half-hour segment, for the record, 175, we heard about some suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of JFK Jr., that in an interview with veteran journalist John Bryan. JFK Jr. certainly was, uh, to a certain extent at least, the heir to a political heritage, and there is very disturbing evidence that to a certain extent that political heritage may have claimed his life as it did uh, the lives of his father, and uncle recall that in that interview, again, for the record segment 175, John related, and related from uh, credible documentary sources, the musings of a number of political pundits that JFK Jr. was going to be offered the presidency or vice presidency of the United States, more than likely the vice presidency. What we're going to do now is to take a look at another person who had uh, a political heritage, was born to a political heritage, albeit someone uh, very different from JFK Jr. Let me stress at the outset that I have virtually no familiarity with uh, rap music, and I neither support nor uh, criticize it. It's simply something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, there certainly is a fair amount of rap that is political, and uh, one of the people who garnered a great deal of publicity in the rap world was the late Tupac Shakur. At a talk in February of 1997, I was asked a question about Tupac Shakur's death. Actually, yeah, this is February of 97. I was asked a question about Tupac Shakur's death, and uh, really was not in a position to comment one way or another about his murder in 1996. A listener sent me an article from Covert Action Quarterly's issue number 67 from the spring and summer of 1999, which has an article by John Potash, uh, who is a journalist out of Brooklyn, who publishes a, a journal named, uh, entitled, I should say, Social Justice Action Quarterly. And this is about Tupac Shakur, who has a heritage with the Black Panthers, who, of course, were the focal point of the COINTELPRO program in the 1960s and 1970s, and were deep-sixed as a result of that. Uh, Tupac Shakur was born, to an extent, to, into a Panther heritage, and apparently was a politically involved and uh, outspokenly politically involved individual. And there are a number of very, cir very suspicious circumstances surrounding his death. And so, you know, as different as he is from JFK Jr., I think both, in a sense, appear to have been the heirs to a political heritage which may have claimed their lives. Again, research credit on this goes to, the, goes to a listener. This is from Covert Action Quarterly, again, number 67, from the summer and spring of 1999. It's by John Potash, or Potash, P-O-T-A-S-H. It's entitled, Tupac's Panther Shadow, the Political Targeting of Tupac Shakur. And it reads as follows. Top-selling rap and film star Tupac Amaru Shakur was murdered in Las Vegas in September of 1996. He was riding in the passenger seat of his record label owner Marion Suge Knight's BMW on the city's main strip when a white Cadillac with gunmen inside pulled up on the rapper's side. Many of the 15 or more shots fired would fatally wound Shakur, while Knight's head was slightly grazed by one ricocheting bullet. This killing followed a near-fatal shooting of Shakur in New York two years earlier. The circumstances surrounding that will be relayed later in the article. At 25, Tupac Shakur was one of the most dynamic and successful artists of his generation. His chart-topping album sold over 9 million copies before his death, and he co-starred in six films with well-known actors such as Jim Belushi, Tim Roth, and his friend Mickey Rourke. The brutal end of so promising a career attracted widespread attention, but fundamental questions about the case remain unanswered. They concern vicious police actions and harassment against Shakur by law enforcement authorities. One less publicized aspect of Shakur's high-profile life was that his mother and extended family were leading Black Panther figures of the 1960s and 1970s. Research on FBI monitoring of Shakur from his early adolescence reflects patterns, apparent, reflects patterns of police surveillance, evidence of government ties to some of his associates, suspicious deaths of people connected to him, and mainstream media's misinformation about Shakur's political activism. All these factors mirror Tupac Shakur's Black Panther heritage. And the next section is called Shakur's Death. While numerous media accounts portray the rap world as extremely violent, a product of the rough ghetto gang life some rap lyrics dramatize, most of the murders in that world began with the apparent targeting of Tupac and continued after his death. The Las Vegas Police Department murder, quote, investigation, unquote, failed to come to any conclusion. Award-winning Las Vegas Sun police reporter Kathy Scott wrote a page-long, quote, 
list of questionable decisions in the Tupac Shakur homicide investigation, unquote, suggesting no conclusions were actually ever sought. The Las Vegas police claimed that no witnesses to the murder came forward. But Shakur's backup singer, his cousin Yafeu Fula, F-U-L-A, I may be pronouncing some of these, mispronouncing some of these names, beginning again, the Las Vegas police claimed that no witnesses to the murder came forward. But Shakur's backup singer, his cousin Yafeu Fula, immediately told police that he thought he could identify the killer in a lineup. They failed to follow usual procedures and did not detain Fula as a witness. Two months later in New Jersey, Fula, by the way spelled F-U-L-A, was murdered in his girlfriend's apartment stairwell. The local police reported the murder as drug-related, later admitting there was no substantiation for this claim. In another unusual police action on the night of Shakur's murder, the two Las Vegas motorcycle officers who heard the shots failed to split up, one to secure the crime scene and gather witnesses and evidence, the other to pursue the fleeing vehicles, standard procedure. The next section is called Panther Legacy. While police acted suspiciously in the events surrounding Shakur's murder, their behavior long before his death is even more telling. As part of the FBI's well-documented counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO, against radical activists in 1969, New York police arrested Shakur's mother, New York Black Panther member Afeni Shakur. As one of the Black Panther 21, she was charged with 30 counts amounting to an overall plan to harass and destroy elements of society, unquote. Despite little formal education, Afeni successfully defended herself in court and was acquitted with the other Panther members. Afeni had developed a relationship with fellow Panther 21 revolutionary Mutulu Shakur, who later became Tupac's surrogate father. In addition to being char charged in the 1979 jailbreak of New York Panther Asata Shakur, in 1981 Mutulu was sought, along with a coalition of revolutionaries, for the robbery of a Brinks armored truck. Until Mutulu's capture in 1986 by New York's Joint Terrorist Task Force, or JTTF, the FBI periodically entered Tupac's schools to question him regarding the whereabouts of his fugitive surrogate father. Tupac was heir to a militant family. A feigny named Los Angeles Panther leader Elmer Geronimo Pratt, her son's godfather. COINTELPRO's targeting of Pratt was an example of how the FBI cooperated with local police intelligence to target Panther chapters in dozens of cities. Police meddled in the lives of many Black Panthers through false arrests leading to beatings, attempted murder, and murder. These well-documented cases included evidence, i.e. partial admissions by police and FBI, that in 1969 an undercover agent drugged Illinois Panther leader Fred Hampton so that the police could murder him in his sleep. Shortly before the Chicago raid, Hampton had flown to L.A. to meet with local Panther leader Pratt. Soon after the Chicago raid, L.A. Panther headquarters was also raided and Pratt's bed shot at, though he was luckily sleeping on the floor. Pratt was later convicted of a Los Angeles robbery and murder in 1972. The massive police and prosecutorial misconduct, including the use of a police informant as the witness to his alleged confession, convinced a judge to rule in 1997, after 25 years, that Pratt should be released from prison. Defense lawyers eventually forced the FBI's release of phone taps of a Panther meeting in Oakland, which Pratt was attending at the time of the murder in L.A. The FBI admitted that the specific sections of the tape which would have had Pratt on it were, quote, accidentally lost or destroyed, unquote. FBI actions against Pratt in conjunction with the state's Criminal Intelligence and Investigation Unit and Los Angeles Police Department's Criminal Conspiracy Section suggest similar police tactics as part of continued COINTELPRO interest by law enforcement agencies and Panther families that would be echoed throughout Shakur's life. By the way, in RFA Program 23, we dealt with the LAPD's Criminal Conspiracy Section and also the COINTELPRO program and uh, other similar activities. That, of course, is available from Spitfire, time permitting. I'll give the address, etc., at the end of this program. Continuing with this article... Despite the Black Panther's wildfire spread to dozens of cities by the early 1970s, the FBI and Police Department's COINTELPRO activities all but extinguished the group by the end of the decade. The Black Panthers and the radical black nationalist movement more generally had been effectively destroyed. But the underlying problem of racism that had given rise to the movement remained. The next section is called COINTELPRO continues. Although COINTELPRO formally ended in 1971, at least one ex-FBI agent stated that the FBI informally continued the same program by framing it in different terms. 
particular evidence of COINTELPRO's informal continuance has come out in class action suits in New York City. In a landmark case challenging COINTELPRO activities in New York City, quote, Police Commissioner Murphy conceded that the police department was engaged in the vast bulk of activities described in the class action complaint, including the surreptitious surveillance and undercover infiltration of the political activities of individuals and groups, unquote. The class action suit, brought by a coalition of activists, also exposed the activities of, quote, physical and verbal coercion, provocation of violence, and recruitment to act as police informers, unquote, against New Yorkers involved in lawful political and social activities. One Panther historian noted that, quote, at least five boss or Bureau of Special Service agents were planted inside the Panther Party almost from its inception, beginning at once to worm their way into positions of power. The settlement of this case led to a court order in 1985 stipulating specific guidelines for future police activity. Police admitted there was a special unit called the Black Desk to monitor black New Yorkers. Boss illegal police surveillance on the black liberation movement in the 1980s, which included targeting Tupac Shakur's lawyer, Michael Warren, was found to have violated the guidelines in a 1989 opinion. Statewide, the JTTF, an FBI police amalgam, had hunted down Mutulu Shakur, among other terrorists, and harassed their supporters. Terrorists, by the way, is in quotes here. The question remains whether the COINTELPRO activities carried out by Boss under the auspices of the Black Desk and JTTF were continued under a different police unit name in the 1990s. Often described as the Special Elite Police Unit with an almost, ent almost completely white racial makeup, New York City's Select Street Crime Unit would be the most likely candidate. New evidence detailed below suggests that COINTELPRO tactics, tactics against blacks in particular may have been behind the first near-fatal shooting of Shakur in New York in 1994. The next section is called Fame and Politics. By the end of the Reagan-Bush era, Shakur's auspicious musical debut, including lyrics discussing his Black Panther family, coupled with leading movie roles, threatened to bring the Panthers back into vogue. Thus, it is no coincidence that Shakur attracted police attention in direct proportion to his fame and success. In line with to Shakur's quote, I never had a record until I made a record, unquote, shortly after his successful solo debut, Oakland police ticketed him for jaywalking, then arrested and beat him in custody. Shakur's first record, Tupacalypse Now, railed against the FBI, the CIA, and President Bush. In 1992, a year after that album's release, Vice President Dan Quayle and later Senator Bob Dole singled him out as responsible for police deaths. With the FBI watching Shakur since he was a teen and his leadership in the New African Panthers, a group dedicated to replicating the Black Panthers, police involvement in his life deserves more scrutiny. While Shakur's lyrics often dramatized inner city life, including what some might view as negative images, glorifying gang life, and denigrating women, they also included many positive political messages ideas about Malcolm X and various Black Panthers. As a youth, Shakur performed benefits for Black Panther prisoners. By 19, he sang with the Grammy-nominated band Digital Underground. Besides his stint as a Panther chairman and his Underground Railroad thug life movement, Shakur participated in a Stop the Violence program, helped with a home for at-risk youth, sponsored a Celebrity Youth League, joined Central American Solidarity Benefits, and regularly spoke at rallies for voter registration and progressive activist groups. The nature of the beneficiaries of Shakur's ever-increasing success must have set off alarms in the intelligence world. Some of Shakur's enormous wealth, the estimated worth of his 200 unreleased recordings alone was over $100 million, was donated to programs and causes his Panther family supported, including Afeni Shakur's research efforts with her imprisoned partner Matulu, which eventually contributed to the release of Pratt in 1997. Shakur was also achieving a newfound maturity in his mid-twenties. His engagement to Kidada Jones, daughter of music, mo music mogul and Vibe magazine owner jazz composer Quincy Jones, must have worried police and intelligence officials because of the vast wealth and influence of the elder Jones and concern that Shakur's activist projects, such as his thug life movement to turn drug dealers into lawful singers, and his last interview statements of going back to his family ways would mark a return to his earlier radical activism. The next uh, section is called The Setup. 
The finding of continued COINTELPRO type activities adds weight to evidence that Shakur's associate Jacques Agnon, a.k.a. Ricardo Brown, a.k.a. Nigel, last name by the way, A-G-N-A-N-T, was an undercover agent who infiltrated his life and contributed to his legal problems. In 1993, after befriending Shakur, Agnon Agnant introduced Shakur to Ayana Jackson the night she had consensual sex with the singer, first on a dance floor and then in his hotel room. In a second visit to Shakur's hotel room several days later, set up again by Agnant, Jackson charged Shakur, Agnant, and two others with sexual assault. Events around the trial point to Agnant's government connections. Agnant's trial lawyer, Paul Brenner, had represented the Policeman's Benevolent Association for many years. In addition, Agnant's case was severed from that of the other defendants without protest from the prosecutors. And after Shakur's trial, Agnet's felony indictment was dismissed, and he simply pleaded guilty to two misdemeanors. By the way, I may be mispronouncing that individual's name. Shakur was convicted of three of the nine charges relating only to non-consensual touching of Jackson's buttocks, typically, typically reported only as sexual abuse, unquote, and sentenced to one and a half to four and a half years, an extremely harsh sentence. In 1994, New York City police admitted accidentally erasing, unquote, a tape Shakur and companions had of Jackson that supported Shakur's defense. His lawyer, Michael Warren, successfully argued that the police also planted guns in the hotel suite where the supposed assault occurred. Jacques Agnet was also connected to Shakur's near-fatal mugging in late November of 1994. Toward the end of Shakur's sexual assault trial, Agnet was seen several times secretly following Shakur. Several days later, Booker, unquote, a man Agnet had introduced to Shakur, paged the singer and asked him to come to a studio in Times Square to record with a new rapper. Booker called, called Shakur insistently that night, lied to him about who would be there, and offered $7,000 cash from his pocket to get Shakur to the building. When Shakur arrived with three companions, two men held him at gunpoint in the lobby and stripped him of his gold jewelry, although they left his diamond-encrusted Rolex, which Agnet had, brought for him, had bought for him. Then they shot him in the groin and twice in the head while he was face down on the floor. The next section is called New York Street Crime Unit. Some suspicious aspects of the event were noted by editors of the Amsterdam News. Shakur and a companion both said they saw a police car outside the lobby doors on Broadway immediately after the assailants fled, gun in hand. The New York police reported this as a random mugging, yet the assailants picked an extremely well-lit Times Square area for a robbery. In what the Washington Post described as, quote, one of the many strange twists in the case, unquote, three of the same cops who first appeared a year earlier at Tupac's hotel in the sexual assault arrest were the first two to arrive at this near-fatal, quote, mugging, unquote. And at least one has been identified as a member of New York's now infamous street crime unit. The next section is called A History of Provocations. There are many examples of police and intelligence provocations against Panthers, including infiltrators, fake letters, fabricated rivalries, etc. After Shakur's imprisonment for the sexual abuse conviction, jail inmate informants, unquote, and anonymous letters he received led the singer to believe that his fellow rapper, friend Biggie Smalls, a.k.a. Christopher Wallace, had set up the shooting, even though Smalls lacked a motive for doing so. Biggie Smalls was killed in Los Angeles in 1997, seven months after Shakur's murder. The L.A. Times reported that New York police officers were near the murder scene when it occurred, supposedly taking part in a federal investigation into Smalls' record label. His death helped, quote, substantiate, unquote, the East-West rap war that the authorities were trying to foster and directed suspicions toward Brooklyn-based Smalls for California-based Shakur's death. Political writer Christian Parenti suggests that the East-West rap music food, as well as Shakur's sexual assault charge, may have been a latter-day COINTELPRO against rap artists. The next section is called A Desperate Agreement. After rejecting two previous offers from Death Row Records, owner-producer Marion Suge Knight, an, Im an imprisoned Tupac Shakur, beginning again, after rejecting two previous offers from Death Row Records owner-producer Marion Suge Knight, an imprisoned Tupac Shakur was finally forced to sign a contract that included his bail money. But people close to Shakur knew he wanted to leave Death Row and start his own label. Ten days before his murder, Shakur fired Death Row lawyer Dave Kenner, who had been assigned to him by night. 
Friends of Shakur reported that this move was very dangerous because of Kenner's power in death row records and Knight's violent business practices. LAPD intelligence operations suggest Knight's connection to a government program. Los Angeles was the site of their largest Western FBI police intelligence collaboration against Black Panthers in the 1960s and 1970s, as described above in the targeting of Geronimo Pratt. L.A. was also the site of the CIA Contra connection to crack cocaine in the 1980s, and there is evidence that Knight was involved in drug dealing at that time. Crack cocaine infiltrated into South Central L.A., created millionaires, some of whom worked with the authorities, particularly the notorious government collaborator Freeway Ricky Ross. One of L.A.'s two top cocaine dealers who came on the scene at the time as Ross and reportedly, quote, ended up buying from him and learning from him, unquote, was Michael Harris. Harris, who ended up in jail, was represented by David Kenner, who convinced him to put up the first million dollars to start Death Row Records. Kenner made himself president of Death Row Records and later completely cut Harris out of the company. Harris is currently suing Kenner. The next role, the next section is called Suge's Role. It was Suge Knight who was driving the car in Las Vegas the night of Tupac's murder. Kidada Jones, Tupac's fiancé, reported that Tupac wanted to drive his own car that night, but Knight convinced the rapper to ride with him in an open-windowed BMW. According to an ex-bodyguard of Knight's, the murder scene was, quote, aberrant, unquote, because there were no armed bodyguards in Knight's car, nor in the accompanying car behind them. Although Knight had lived in Las Vegas for several years and knew the area well, he made a curious U-turn away from a nearby hospital as Shakur lay dying next to him. Weeks later, Knight stated that he wouldn't give anyone information about the killers because, quote, it's not my job, unquote. Knight was arrested and jailed for violating his probation a few days after Shakur's death. He has continued to run death row records from his jail cell. In early April, Knight was named as a suspect in Biggie Small's murder, which the authorities claim he masterminded from jail. After Tupac's death, Afeni Shakur was told that her son owed death row money, even though his albums for the company had grossed over $150 million in sales. 70% of rap albums are bought by white youth. While Afeni won the legal right to obtain all of her son's unreleased recordings, she only received a portion of them from Death Row. And their more than $100 million estimated, uh, their more than $100 million estimated value would soon decrease. With very little financial motive for the only suspect, Death Row, government pressure probably led Knight to let 13 illegal bootleg discs hit the streets and massively devalue Afeni Shakur's inherited estate. The last section's called Tupac's Legacy. In his last interviews, Shakur espoused radical political plans and ideas. He spoke of... Actually... He was pulled over by two plainclothes New York cops who claimed he was driving with his head... Actually, let me... Uh, this is a different section. Let me begin again. In his last interviews, Shakur espoused radical political ideas and plans. He spoke of religion as social control, of returning to his family ways, but, quote, with a more militant philosophy, unquote, of plans to start an interracial, lost tribe political party and to devote future album proceeds to start community centers. He also explained that his trademark W hand sign, which had indicated the West Coast, would now mean war. He said, quote, West Coast and East Coast together to gain power for black America, unquote. Shakur's incredible fan devotion and societal influence were likely thorns in the side of the intelligence community. After his death, Shakur received tributes by leading intellectuals and was memorialized in mass assemblies at black colleges. His legacy sparked courses devoted to his work at prestigious universities, including the University of California at Berkeley. While unsubstantiated versions of the story behind Tupac Shakur's death are frequently asserted, there has been no real independent investigation of government involvement. Shakur's political activist life and radical heritage call for such an inquiry. And uh, again, the uh, research credit on this goes to a member of the listening audience. This is an article by John Potash entitled Tupac's Panther Shadow, the Political Targeting of Tupac Shakur from Covert Action Quarterly Number 67 from the spring and summer of 1999. Earlier I alluded to RFA Program 23, which covers uh, some of the historical background to some of the activities described in this article. That and other programs that I've recorded over the years are available from a tape duplication service called Spitfire. 
That's one word, S-P-I-T-F-I-R-E. And they're located at P.O. Box 1179. That's P.O. Box 1179. That's in Ben Lomond, California, capital B-E-N, capital L-O-M-O-N-D, zip code 95005. The email address for Spitfire is spitfire at ix.netcom.com. Once again, that's spitfire at ix.netcom.com. The Spitfire website is at spitfirelist.com. That's one word, S-P-I-T-F-I-R-E-L-I-S-T dot com. And that Spitfire website is equipped with real audio, so you can hear the segments going out to the various stations that carry this program uh, in the week that they are going out. There is also uh, a duplicate website of the Spitfire site on the KFJC webpage at kfjc.org. The KFJC webpage is equipped with uh, interconnecting links so that you can simply click on one of the references to one of the other programs and it will automatically get you there. Once again, Spitfire, P.O. Box 1179, Ben Lomond, California, zip code 95005. Email address spitfire at ix.netcom.com. And uh, the website is spitfirelist.com. You can also find uh, the list on the KFJC webpage. Look at kfjc.org. Look in the Transmissions and Public Affairs sections. I should add that I am not uh, familiar with rap music, nor with the music or work of uh, Tupac Shakur. However, uh, I was asked about uh, this particular connection at a lecture and knew nothing about it. So I hope to the uh, young woman who asked me about that, I hope this uh, answers some of her questions. That concludes this half-hour segment. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for